family. God, receive all we are to glorify your name and all the earth in Jesus' name. You may be seated. I don't know if you ever look at these, but for me, I sometimes notice these, what they call Google Doodles. And on Friday, I said, honey, honey, you've got to check out the Google Doodle. I sent it to her, and it was Casimir Funk. Casimir Funk was a Polish-American biochemist, and he was the first to discover the concept of vitamins and essential nutrients. Now, if you ever come to our home, you'll see we have a very special place on our kitchen island that is dedicated to Rebecca's vitamins. And as you spend time in our family, she gets the kids. Did you take your vitamins? Did you take your gummies? Did you take your this? Did you take... We are a vitamin family. And we could go back and forth on how helpful that is. Some say it's helpful. Others say it's not really. My dad says one multivitamin is all you need. But you know what? I say yes, honey. Yes. We love our vitamins. I will take them. But interesting that as we go through life, we're looking for what do we need for a little more power? What do we need for a little more strength? Look, the days are difficult. The times are tough. Stress seems to be increasing with every year that goes by. We need help. We need deeper resources physically, spiritually, in every way. And I think it's interesting today as we look at the whole gospel for the whole world that when Jesus sent out his people, when he came together on that final day, he emphasized, I have something special for you to carry that out. So let's look to Acts chapter 1, our theme verse for this section. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So that's what we're going to focus on today. So let's get to our scripture reading, our theme scripture reading for today. Matthew 28, a well-known one, but it does talk about power. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven... And on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen, Amen to that one. The word of the Lord. So the first thing we need to look at today is the power of God in Jesus. So when we think about that multivitamin physically, there is no greater power that we have in our walk in this earth than Jesus. Looking again to Matthew 28, look what it says. All authority, he says. All authority in heaven and on earth. I think that dual statement is very important because he's saying, I have all authority in heaven I am one with the Father, the Son, the Spirit. They're noted here in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The triune God is declared right here. One God had three persons. I have all authority in heaven. There's nothing that can be done in the heavens without who I am. All authority in heaven and all authority on earth. Both. And so he makes that statement, go, therefore. The therefore, he says, why can you go? What's the therefore, therefore? You can go because Jesus has said, I have all power. I have all authority, and you're going in my name. You know, today we carry around credit cards, and you have a credit limit, and this, that, and the other. And different people's financial power might be related to their credit limit. Well, we have a heavenly credit limit of all authority in heaven and on earth when we go forth with spiritual work in Jesus' name. And he wanted to give us so much confidence, so much strength. This isn't, hey, once you get conferred with that Bible degree, you know, once you finish that great Bible study series, once you've been one year as this, that, no, 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 no. All authority is in Jesus. 
And John 15, as we abide in him, he goes on and he makes the further emphasis. He says, and behold, I am with you. It's not just that we have authority to tear down strongholds and to build up the powerful works of God in this earth. It's also a promise of presence. It's not just a task to get done. It's not just the jackhammer power to, to blow through whatever we need. It's also the beautiful warmth and comfort as a shepherd. I am with you always to the end of the age. And then he emphasizes the strategy that we all need. Disciples of all nations, baptizing them, emphasizes the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That's our mission. The whole gospel for the whole world in one beautiful verse statement. We also need to look at the power of God in the Holy Spirit. That has been our theme verse in Acts chapter 2, so let's look at it once again. And so, after we know that Christ resurrected, spent time with the disciples, Acts chapter 1, he ascended before them. And then it says right here, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. I don't know where you are in your journey of faith. One of the honors I have as a pastor is to officiate funerals. And whenever I officiate funerals, there's always people with a mixed background of faith. We all have different roads. And I emphasize the reality of the resurrection, that we can be comforted, that I have taken time personally to investigate the historical facts. I have taken time to look at what the Bible says and look at what historians and, and outside evidence, and it proves to us that the resurrection is a historical fact. The proofs were there. The, the visitations, the appearances that people saw, hundreds and hundreds of people. Verse 4, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem. Why? To wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. You remember in, in the Gospel of John, over and over and over, the comfort is going to come. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And so over and over and over, we're reminded, we go in the power and authority of Jesus, and we go in the power and authority of the Holy Spirit. Let's look, chapter 2. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now look at verse 5. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. I think it's important to recognize what happens with the Holy Spirit. God is not calling us to artificially copycat other things that are happening in the Spirit. The Spirit, the Spirit is sovereign. The Spirit of God is sovereign. In that moment of time, the filling came, they spoke in tongues. Why? It says right there in verse 5. Because people were from every nation, and then the gospel was immediately going out to all these people all at once. So that gift of the Holy Spirit, that power was needed in that moment. But you know what? The Holy Spirit is not just a one, one gift. It's many gifts. And the Bible speaks of the different gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so our call is to be connected to the Holy Spirit and in faith, as we see here, wait on the power of the Holy Spirit, not going in the power of ourselves, and then trusting God to flow through us and stepping in by faith. You can't drive a car sitting in a parking lot. The car's got to be on the move. And once you start moving that car, things can happen. So we need to step out in faith. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and see things happen. The other thing I think that it's important, if we're going to truly understand this whole gospel to the whole world, power of Jesus, power of the Spirit, but there was power in humility. Look at the next one. The power of humility in Jesus, Philippians chapter 2. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though 
he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. What was the plan of salvation for us? It was holy God to be put in flesh, emptying himself, humbling himself, put in flesh, and walking among us with such humility that not even everyone recognized who he was. You know, if, if I had my plan, and thank God I'm, it's not my mind who designs things, but, but I would think, well, wouldn't, wouldn't you want to appear a little like more angelic or powerful or, or royal, maybe like, like really 100 feet tall? No, the plan of God was to humble, was to become like a man, was to walk in broken humanity, was to feel our pain so that as we struggle, we know that Christ also struggled. And this is a key to missions. There's a very famous missions book, I'm sure Judy and others know it, called Companion to the Poor by Viv Greek. And this was a book that I read years ago in my mission study. And he begins, Greek begins the book and he says, go to the people, live among them, learn from them. It doesn't say go to the people and bust out your Bible and start preaching day one. No, live among them. Be humble. Learn from them. Look what it says. Start with what they know. Build on what they have. But of the best leaders, when the task is accomplished, the work is done, the people will all remark, we've done it ourselves. What an amazing thought, right? That you become humble, you present the word of God, and then God shows up. It goes on. He gives the advice and he says, it is a strange thing to become poor. What Viv did was he lived among the poorest of the poorest of the poor in Southeast Asia. It is a strange thing becoming poor among the poor. First, you seek to live at their level to do exactly what they're doing. And then, as you do that, you recognize and identify those physical and emotional needs you can't live without, even though they do. You make small adjustments this is acceptable to people. Identification is not imitation. So he was literally saying, you've got to humble yourself so deeply where you are raw, where, where, where you literally are struggling to understand what it means to live in a proper way. Are we willing to humble ourselves to bring the gospel to others? Are we willing to humble ourselves to the point of, of actually giving up some of our own preferences? so that perhaps we can gain an open door of conversation. That's what Jesus did. I think we also see it in the church, power of humility in the church. Thank you, Stephen, for reading Acts chapter 17, one of my favorite stories in the book of Acts. Look what happened here. Paul gives us an amazing example of a great missionary strategy, and it says here in Acts chapter 17, it says, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw the city was full of idols. Now, that's interesting. He goes into a new city. He has purpose to bring the gospel. And immediately, he's confronted with a different spiritual dynamic, right? With, a, with, with, with an opposing spiritual dynamic. So what did he do? You know, I'm sure he began praying. I'm sure, God, give me wisdom. How do I deal with this? Interesting. We might learn from this, so let's see. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons. Now we know that through the book of Acts, this was a pattern. He would, he would go to the synagogues. He would talk to the Jewish folks first. In Romans, it says the gospel to the Jews and then to the Gentiles because the Jews had the honor of hearing the gospel since they were the portal through which the Ten Commandments came and the lineage of Christ. So he went to the Jews first in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Verse 18, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers conversed with him. Okay, how did that go? Some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. We see all through Acts and through the New Testament the emphasis of the resurrection. 
we need to remind people of the resurrection in Jesus and the resurrected life in our own hearts and souls spiritually. But once again, now he sees the idols, he converses with these people, he's being put down, he's being mocked. So what does he do? Look what he did. He honored culture and used it as a bridge. He didn't mock back. He didn't, he didn't cut them down. He didn't say, I'm going to give you a three-point reason why those people are, are, are get you on the wrong road. Look what he did. Verse 22. I love this phrase. Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. Right? I mean, wouldn't you think he would have said, hey, um, I have to set you straight on a couple items here. I need to let you know that those I, uh, that, uh, that you need to hear a couple quotes from the Old Testament on idolatry. No, he began by honoring their culture. I perceive that in every way you're religious. They were, they were grappling, they were wrestling with spirituality. What does it mean? For I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. Once again, he could have just mocked those. I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Look what he did. He used that as a springboard. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. He took the very reality of their wrestling, of their images, of their philosophy, and instead of just tearing it down, he used it as a springboard. Hey, this is an opportunity for us to build a bridge here. One of the gifts I had living overseas in the country of Jordan for a couple of years was I found out that on the one hand, when you engage our Muslim friends, they like to debate, just like here. There's a lot of spiritual talk. They, they, they have their spiritual debates and discussions. But if you spend time with your Muslim friends, you'll find that they will quickly drift into a debate of Jesus as the Son of God and the Trinity and how that just can't be true. However, as you get to know our Muslim friends, there's so many parallels to springboard conversation. Jesus, they believe, was virgin born. Jesus, they believe, did miracles. Jesus, they believe, was filled with the Spirit. And Jesus, they believe, is coming back and he's going to be the one that they stand before on the final judgment day. So instead of doing all the arguing back and forth, what about saying, hey, just a thought? I know, I, I know the Quran does emphasize that, that you're going to stand before Jesus one day. I, I, could, I could let you know Jesus a little bit since you're going to stand before him. Let me tell you a little bit about the Jesus that I know and love. And then there's an open door there. So what's our approach? Paul used it as a springboard. Look, he also quoted from their authors. Look, verse 27. That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. So he used their own literature. He used their own quotes. What they believed to be important to think about and, 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 to, and to guide them into the spiritual life. And he said, guess what? Guess what? I want to go a little deeper with those realities. Track with me here. And then he said, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. And then he, he pressed on and he went deeper. And then in verse 30, he finally says, and he begins to culminate the whole discussion. The times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. So he did get to the call. And then he talks about the resurrection. He has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So I think it's important to remember that as we engage people, we need to look at opportunities of open doors, not just correcting things that they might not fully understand or not just getting into a bait of when I was overseas in Jordan I had the privilege of of spending time and writing my doctoral dissertation and when I was there I took what they call the Decalogue the Ten Commandments and you might know that the Ten Commandments is holy scripture for Christians and our Jewish friends of course and our Muslim friends 
The holy books by our Muslim friends believe the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, that's holy writing. The Psalms, holy writing. They believe the Injil, the Gospel, holy writings. So there's a lot of opportunity to build bridges. So I took the Decalogue and I wrote a youth leadership development curriculum to Muslim youth. And I used all their authors, I used all their philosophers, I used their famous books, and we developed something for the Muslim youth. Founded on the Ten Commandments, but founded also in their culture. There's things that we can do to reach out to others. And we need to use these opportunities to build bridges. We also need to consider today the power of partnership. Because, look, I understand Christ Chapel. I, I understand our, our demographic. Most of us are not going to go overseas. Most of us are not in that stage of life. But let me tell you that on my very first mission trip in 1985 to Peru, I went with teen missions, and I still have a beloved place in my heart for Bob and Betty Lane. They were the leaders of our trip, and we went to the deepest jungle in Peru where almost no had ever been, no Westerner had ever been. A couple of Swiss missionaries got there just a few months before we arrived, and we went there to build an airstrip. And Bob and Betty Lane, Bob had just retired from being a lifetime fireman. And he decided, I want to do more. I'm retired, I'm going to refire. I'm not just going to retire, I'm going to refire. And Bob and Betty gave their lives all over the world, and God gave them a beautiful season of missions. So we never know what God's going to call us to do. But that being said, I do understand that for most of us, our call is going to be here as partners. And that's, that's a powerful, the power of partnership cannot be underestimated. Let's look at Philippians 1. What does it say there? It says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Amen to that? That was our college theme verse when I attended Cedarville years ago. I declare it in each of our lives now in Christ Chapel. That, oh God, what you began, the good work, you'll bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He goes on. He goes, you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. You're right there with me. I'm in prison, but you're with me. I need you by my side. Now, it's interesting in that culture, many times when they were in prison, the people would need to actually bring food from the outside. And they would need to nurture them from the outside. So this was more than, than, than just a spiritual statement. This very well could have been a, a cry for, for partnership to care for him. We need our missionaries to know that we are by their side. Colossians chapter 4, look what it says. Pray also for us. I mean, this is the Apostle Paul, right? He's the prayer guy. He's the prayer warrior. No, no. Please, he says, pray for us that God may open a door for the world to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. I mean, we think of Paul like, what? You need to pray for me. No, I need your partnership. I need that open door. I need clarity when I preach. I can't just give an Acts 17 servant perfectly every single day. I need your prayers to preach with clarity all the time. How are we doing praying for our missionaries to have open doors, praying for power for our missionaries? It goes on in Philemon chapter 1. Philemon, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers. The apostle Paul was, was writing this to, to a leader, a wealthy man, and he was trying to uh, reconcile a situation with the servant. And so Paul was saying, I thank my God when I remember about you, Philemon, in my prayers, because I hear of your love and the faith you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. This is a generous man. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective. So Paul asked for prayers, but then he also said, hey, yes. He says, I pray that the sharing of your... Paul was also praying for his partners. I know our dear servant, Judy, we pray for her. It's an honor. Thank you for your prayers, Judy. We need them. I need them. Christ Chapel needs them. And our missionaries pray for us also. I know that many of us have deep relationships, 
have significant relationships with our missionaries. We pray for them, but they pray for us. It's a two-way street. Second Thessalonians. Finally, brothers, pray for us, it says, that the word of the Lord may speed ahead. I love that. And be honored as has happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. So once again, I need your partnership so the word of God can go. We need to pray for our missionaries. We have a beautiful, beautiful partnership with Guy and Satili. Uh, Guy, Guy, she was here, Guy and Sandra Satili. And we know the amazing outreach that they're going to have in 2024 and beyond. They're depending on our prayers. Every one of our missionaries, we love the Curly's work in Poland. And we could name every single one. They're depending on us that the word of the Lord will speed ahead. They're putting their lives on the front line, as we heard last week from Kim. Putting her, line on, her life on the front line because she wants fruit. She wants to see the word of the Lord go forth. That's going to happen by our prayer. So I'm going to ask you, church, let's just do a little tip. Let's do a little quiz. How are we doing in partnering with our missionaries? For our missions conference in the fall, we developed these amazing prayer books. I've never come to any missionary conference with better information about our missionaries. We love Dave and Terry, and we did a great job. They did a great job in putting this, as they do every year. And we go through this book, and it lists our missionaries one by one, gives their mailing address, prayer requests, email. You can write them today. Where's your, I mean, tell me right now, where's your book? Is it next to your Bible on your, on your devotional stand? Is it, is, it, is it on your fridge so you can remember? Is it buried under a pile of papers? I have to be honest, I lost mine. But I'm committing to you today that I'm going to put mine on my devotional table. And I ask every single one of you, where is your prayer book? Get it out. Make it part of your devotions. Whether it's once a week, whether it's once a day, something, church. If we're really going to believe that the power happens in partnership, if we're, we're really going to believe, okay, God, I can't go all over the world, but I want to be counted to the ends of the earth. Okay, we can do it. In prayer, I mean, those partnership verses were more than anything about prayer. Are you going to, let's all commit to that. I'd be happy to print another hundred of these, no problem. Selena, can you raise your hand? Get a hold of Selena, info at ChristChapelCapeCon.org. She will send you an electronic copy if you lost yours. I need, we need to do this. What about your time? When is your prayer time? I find in my devotional life, if I don't set a time, it doesn't happen. It's like, oh, I'll do devotions today. Well, if I don't say the first thing in my day, as soon as I wake up, shot of espresso, sit down for devotions. It just doesn't happen. So I have set a time for my devotions. I am now going to add a time for my missionary prayer. I'm going to do my shot. I'm going to do my devotions. And I'm going to get on my knees and pray for our missionary every day. You know, I had a wonderful year of devotions the last couple of years because I've been more intentional. I've been walking with the Lord for 40 years, but I've been more intentional about my devotions because I set that time. Church, wouldn't it be cool if we all really commit to this and then our next missionary conference, they're like, you wouldn't believe it? Like around the time of March, the power of God began to multiply. The fruit came in waves that we never had before. Be like, wow, like God, you're doing something. Who do you pray with? We know that there's multiplied prayer power when we come together. I know it's Steve Duncan's. I know it's Ray Bell's heart that you'll join them at their 6 a.m. prayer Zoom that they have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Pick a day, every day, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., get the link. I'm sure they'll commit to pray for the missionaries. I'm sure if you come in and you say, hey, can we pray a minute for these missionaries? They'll do it. I love our Wednesday prayer time at 1 p.m. We have a listing of groups in the back, all the different Bible studies. Bible study leaders, can, can, can you please commit to pray for our missionaries? One missionary every single gathering. 
Can we integrate that into our Bible study list? So we've got our prayer book. We've got our time. We're praying together. And then finally, what about relationship? Who do you know personally? When was the last time you wrote an email, you received an email from a missionary? We have all the information right here. It's crazy. Like this world that we live in, unlimited knowledge, unlimited opportunity for connection. And yet, the challenge today is to take advantage of all that we have at our fingertips. I'm encouraging our church. From now to the end of the month, we have a couple, we have, we, we have a couple more days to do it, that we would write a missionary and say, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray like I haven't. I want to be connected like I haven't. I've got your requests from the fall, but, but, but what's something new? And then share something about your life so that they can feel connected to you as well. Amen? Lord, we lift up our missionaries and we want to be good partners. Let that happen in Jesus' name. The last thing that I want to mention in terms of the gospel to the ends of the earth, we need to focus on the power of praise. We need to focus on the good stuff, on results, on celebration. Thank you, Lord, for your harvest. That's important, right? Well, look at the next slide as we see here. Thessalonians, what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you, he says? Look at the new living. After all, what gives us hope and joy? Let me ask you, church, what, what gives you hope and joy? Pastor, what gives you hope and joy? What will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns? That's the whole gospel for the whole world. This is the last message that we're leaving with right now. The whole gospel for the whole world. Why are we doing it? What's the point? Right there. It is you. Changed lives. Multiplied lives. Disciples engaged in life-changing activities. Yes, you are our pride and joy. And one couple I take pride and joy with today is Stephen and Delene. If you could come up. Stephen and Delene Russell are such a gift to Cape Cod. They've given their lives in ministry. They are from South Africa, and I hope you all get to have coffee and a time. They spend about three hours, two and a half, three hours at their house and other fellowship times and worship times. And they were with one of the most beautiful evangelistic associations in South Africa. And they were going off to disciple those who came to faith. And what was beautiful about Stephen and Deline is they said, our heart is to make sure those people don't just attend an evangelistic event, but they get plugged into churches. After that, God led Deline to start a multicultural, interracial school before apartheid, a forerunner, this amazing school in South Africa. In the midst of this country torn with prejudice, she started one of the first racial reconciliation schools, which still goes on today. They then came to Cape Cod, and they served as a pastor team for over 20 years. And just recently, they felt led. God is calling us to Christ Chapel. We believe there's promises of God at Christ Chapel. We believe there's unfulfilled gifts and calling at Christ Chapel and gifts and calling that God has poured in us. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. amen. Thank you, Lord, for Stephen and Deline. I want to call up Virgie Wakefield. Thank you. I want to call up Virgie Wakefield. Come on up, Virgie. If you could come up front, Virgie. I would like to call up Trisha Thomas and Danny and Selena Sawyer. Virgie's a special gift to us here because we know Virgie. Many of us know Virgie. And she has a passionate heart for the word, for God's people, just a gushing heart of God. And Virgie uh, has a membership at another church but she said pastor greg i'd like to have a dual membership we have what we call associate memberships here she wants to honor her husband and keep a part of a membership at another church because at that other church she wants to be with her husband but she says i also feel part of christ chapel virgie we love you we need you trisha thomas is also coming back to us uh, reinstating her membership god had her here raised her kids in our children's ministry her dad played on the worship team for a little while, and she just loves the Lord. 
Uh, for all that, that know Trisha, I'm excited about God using Trisha's gifts here. She has amazing gifts, love for the word. She has a heart to start something special with our women. So yes, Lord. We also have Danny Sawyer, who's restarting, who is also reactivating his membership here with his wife, Selena, who joins as, who want, would like to join as a new member today. But Danny, I love the fact that you're in the trenches with the people of need in Cape Cod. Under Danny's leadership, the veterans food outreach has gone from simply a few dozen, 20, 30, 40, and exploded to how many, Danny? 2,200 people a month. They not only come to the Veterans Center, they have a van that takes the food to them. They have a van that goes over to Martha's Vineyard. Danny is on the front lines with the poor. And Danny's my guy because you know what? Nobody would know. He's not looking for credit. And you know who Danny's brought to church? Our beloved Tom. Tom, I want to thank you for what you do at the soup kitchen too. Tom is a beautiful man of God and thank you for what you do to serve the poor. Selena also is here today because she has been serving as, as the assistant in the office, and she has really, all that have worked with her, they all come and they say to me, I don't ask, but they say to me, man, she's so easy to work with. She gets stuff done. But Selena just really took the membership class, like, to heart. I sent it out to everybody, and she was, like, memorizing it. She made sure that she memorized that one statement about in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in everything else, charity. And so she really took to heart, hey, this is important. I want to thank God for Barbara Fitzgerald. Barbara, can you come up? Barbara Fitzgerald is a beautiful woman of God, and she, she uh, read for us last week. But Barbara was baptized right here, actually. I didn't know that. But she shared her story that she was baptized right here when she was with Grace Harbor Church. And Barbara, I bragged on you a couple weeks ago about your purple hair. She uses her purple hair as a conversation starter to open the doors so she can share life and share faith with Jesus. Can you believe that? Yay, Barbara. That's the coolest tool that I've known someone to use, purple hair for the gospel. I also want to bring up Sophie Klenert, Ben Klenert, and Wendy Klenert. These are Loring Johnson's grandchildren. And so we have our beautiful Loring Johnson represented we have 20 somethings who are wanting to join our church could you say amen to that amen. amen to that sophie she is on the front lines doing this and doing that at the airport she greets all the the uh, uppity ups at the airport making sure they don't crash and die and then uh, ben also is loring's um grandson but it was my honor uh together with rebecca we were able to officiate their beautiful wedding at the beach a couple months ago. And Ben, Wendy, and I, we spent hours and hours together counseling, talking, going through the church membership, going through all the questions that they have. And they're so excited to join today. And then finally, Rebecca Reeves. Could you put a picture up? Re Rebecca Reeves is in Florida. She has been attending a lot of things. She's very excited to join the church. She's the one who came to me and said, Pastor, I've been to a lot of churches, but when I came to this church, it felt like home. Literally, she goes, I was stepped in the door, and I was like, yeah! She told me about her baptism. She was baptized by the son of C. Everett Koop, which is so cool, right? She was baptized by Dr. David Koop, and her in-laws, Charles and Carol, can you wave to us? Her in-laws are part, they, they love coming to our church, and we have up front Rebecca and her husband, Greg, we have two Rebecca and Gregs in the church, and so they had to be in Florida right now for a family commitment, but she's very, very excited. We also spent a lot of time in terms of the membership, in terms of the classes, baptism, statement of faith, signed off on all those different things. And so at this time, I want to also thank God for Dr. Seppo. Dr. Seppo, if you could come forward, I want to thank God for Dr. Seppo. He's our moderator, but he also has served a life of helping others physically, helping this church in terms of its formation, but also spiritually. In Seppo, I've spent extra time with Seppo over the last few weeks, and in that, uh, actually, we got to talk more about shop. I was like, Seppo, I want to hear about your operations 
about your doctor stuff. And uh, I know most of you know these things. I'm kind of new to his amazing life. But uh, Seppo is our moderator, and so I'll pass it over to you in terms of tra transitioning to a proper meeting and prayer. Well, we have to bring members in that are duly constituted meeting of the congregation. We've had people waiting now for six months or more to come in because we haven't had a duly constituted meeting. But today, this meeting is now official, and so we can use this meeting to bring new members into the church. It's interesting to see that God created churches. Uh, and that's how he deals with his own, own people. That's how people come in. Mm -hmm. Paul went around meeting men from town to town, creating churches. Mm -hmm. And every church is independent and very special in its own sight. Some are great cathedrals. Others are little village churches like ours. But it's here that God sends his people out and brings them in. Mm. He says that here in Acts, as we were reading earlier today, and the Lord added to their numbers day by day Amen. those who are being saved. And so today for Christ Chapel, he's adding members to our congregation. Amen. And we welcome each of you. Amen. Now I have to ask uh, the members of Christ Chapel to raise your hands so I can see that we have a quorum. <laughs> 